Hello, my name is Luke Castera, and I am the founder and director of product at Octopi by Navis. Today, I'm going to walk you through some cargo terminal EDI flows. This will be a presentation on what is EDI, how is it used around the world in the shipping and maritime industry, and what are some of the key EDI messages that a cargo terminal needs to be able to receive or to send to their partners. So let's get started with what is EDI. EDI stands for Electronic Data Interchange, and it is a concept of businesses electronically communicating information that was traditionally communicated on paper, such as purchase orders, invoices, etc. EDI is used in many industries, um, such as the shipping and maritime industry, banking, um, healthcare industry, etc. And EDI messages are usually exchanged between parties using protocols like SFTP, FTP, or SMTP. SMTP is just a protocol via email. But the most secure way to do EDI is to actually do SFTP. And at Octopi, we always recommend our partners to use SFTP to exchange EDI messages. EDI is actually a very old standard and an older way to do things. A more modern approach for computers to exchange data is to use what's called an application programming interface or an API or webhooks, and usually that uses data formats like XML or JSON. However, the shipping and maritime industry has been slow to adapt these more modern te technologies. So in cargo terminal world, we are kind of stuck with EDI. And there are two actual standards of EDI that's used in these cargo terminals, just to make it a bit more confusing. Um, the first standard is a standard by U the United Nations called EDI-FAC, which stands for Electronic Data Interchange for Administration, Commerce, and Transport. And that standard actually releases two versions every year, which they call A and B. And the most commonly used version in the shipping and maritime industry is the D95B and the D00B. So these are the most common ones that you're going to see. Um, but again, from version to version, there are not huge changes in the standards. They're just little modifications to adapt as the world is changing. The UN EDI FAC standard is kind of the global international standard used by the main shipping lines and carriers and the main cargo terminals around the world. It is more common outside of the United States. But in the United States, there is another competing stand standard it's called NSI X12. The NSI X12 comes from the Accredited Standards Committee, also known as ASX X12, and it is a standards organization, just like the UN. It was done in 1979, um, and it is mostly used by carriers that are located in the U.S. In the U.S., for example, that's a standard that is used to communicate cargo manifests and other information with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. So it's very likely that if you are a cargo terminal and you need to send EDI to a shipping line, if that shipping line is based in the, is based in the U.S., it's a U.S. line, it's very likely that they're going to ask you to send them NSI X12 messages. However, if it's anywhere else in the world, the more, likelihood it, uh, the more likely scenario is that they want to receive UN EDI FAC. The UN EDI FAC happens to be a bit more common than NSI X12. And from my personal experience, having done dozens of EDI integrations for dozens of terminals, um, the EDI FAC is actually a slightly better standard, in my personal opinion, and an easier one to integrate. Now, what do these things mean? So basically, uh, st these standards define a set of messages um, that are kind of complex. If you look at them, if you're not a tech person and you look at this, it sounds very complex. Even if you are a tech person, this looks a bit complex compared to some of the more modern standards that exist today. But essentially, these are messages um, so that um, different computers can communicate with other computers. So for example, the computer at the terminal should be able to communicate with the computer at the shipping line and tell it, hey, this container just got discharged. And when that happens, you might see a message like that being communicated between the two com um, computers. Now, these two um, standards are um, very different. Um, but if you look at this page, you see that there's a lot of similarities as well as the way they are put together. But the key point I want to illustrate on this slide is that this this is complex stuff. This is stuff that you as a cargo terminal operator, you shouldn't have to deal with this. Um, and you should rely on a software that can take care of all this complexity for you so that you don't have to deal with these kind of messages. Because to me, that looks a lot like gibberish. It's very hard to understand. And I definitely um, 
think this should be kept to the experts. So now the first thing I want to do is go over the end port flows at a container terminal. So mostly as a container terminal, your interactions EDI wise are going to be with the shipping lines or carriers, um, AKA carriers that are calling your port. So let's say that you are a terminal that receives containers from Maersk. You're going to want to have an EDI integration between the Maersk system and your terminal operating system, which is the software that you're running at your terminal. And you are going to use that EDI connection to let MERS know about certain events and MERS will also let you know about certain events. So first, let's focus on a um, container that's being imported. So before that vessel arrives at your terminal, you're going to receive a cargo manifest from the shipping line. That cargo manifest will be sent to you if you're using EDI FAC in the Kuskar standard, most likely. It can also be sent to you um, by NCIX12, in which case it's most likely either a 309 or a 310 message. You'll notice that the NCIX12 sometimes um, it's not as standardized as, as the actual EDFX standard. But anyways, um, I'm gonna keep, as I keep going to this, I'm going to give you the equivalent messages in EDFX and in NCIX12. So once a terminal receives a cargo manifest, um, their terminal operating system can process that and you can see all the bill of ladings and everything that's coming on that vessel. Then the vessel operations start, you start discharging containers from that vessel. And every time you discharge a container, you can send a message to the shipping line to let them know that you've discharged a full container, a full import container. You do that by sending a query, if, you, if it's a DFAC, or a 322 message to the shipping line. Now, that container is going to sit at the terminal for a few days until a trucker is going to come pick up that container. When that trucker leaves your gate, or leaves the gate of the terminal, at that point, the system, the software system running at the terminal um, will actually record the movement and send an EDI message to let the line know that that container get it out full. That message is a codeco message or a 322. Again, notice that in EDI FAC, there is a specific message for a discharge, which is a coari, and one for the gate out or for gate moves in general, which is a codeco. Whereas with the NCIX12, the same 322 message is used for both of these movements. It's just that the content, what you put in that message is going to be different so that the shipping line can know whether that's a discharge or a gate movement. So that container now get it out full. Um, that import is pretty much um, at the consignee. That import container is at the consignee. And eventually, they might want to return the empty to the terminal. Now it's possible that that empty gets returned to the terminal and then you get in the empty container at the terminal, in which case the terminal upon processing that get in empty is going to send a codeco to the line to let them know that they've received the container or a 322. But it's also possible that that empty, instead of being returned to the terminal, is returned to a container depot that is outside the terminal, completely independent container depot, okay? Which is why I put this here um, because it's possible as, that as a terminal, you're not seeing that gate in empty move because that empty is going to a, uh, an empty container depot. So this is a summary of the container import flows. Very simple. You receive a Kuska for the cargo manifest and you send a query for discharge and codecos for gate moves. Now let's take a look at the case of a container export flow. So for the container export flow, the shipping line needs to let the terminal know that somebody is going to come to pick up an empty container um, to fulfill a booking. Um, so an exporter, a shipper, um, book the container with the line and the line is then going to send the booking confirmation to the terminal to say, hey, um, this person made a booking for a container to be exported at your terminal. Now, again here, if it is a container depot, the container depot would be the one receiving the coeror message. Um, the coeror message is saying you can empty, you can release that empty container. So a trucker is going to come pick up that empty container from you. It's possible that the terminal plays the role of the depot and they're the ones that, does, um, that, that takes care of that part as well. And then the booking confirmation um, is sent via a copart message or a 301 message. Now for the empty container release, there's not really an equivalent as far as I know um, in NCIX 12. Therefore, I did not put an equivalent message there. Okay? But the booking confirmation, the EDI fact message is copart, 
and the intake to it is a 301. Now, after receiving that message a bit later, the truck is actually gonna show up at the terminal to pick up the empty container. And when that empty container leaves the terminal, the terminal is gonna send a get out empty message via Codeco or 322 to the shipping line. Later on, when that trucker comes back to the terminal and gets in the full container that's ready to be exported or, or loaded on a vessel, the terminal is gonna send a code echo message to let the shipping line know that that container get it in full. Um, that's gonna be a code echo for EDFAC or 322 for NCIX 12. And then finally, when the container gets loaded on the vessel, the terminal will send a message to the shipping line to say, hey, I loaded your container full. And that's done via Coari or 322. Now it's important to understand for loading and discharge messages, depending on the software that the terminal is using, they might be sending these messages in batches every 15 minutes. So they might say every 15 minutes, I'm gonna send all the information for everything that was loaded before or every one hour or every two hours. It depends, different software behave differently. Octopi sends these messages in real time. So that means that whenever a, a get it or get out or a loading message happens at the terminal, Octopi will send that message right away to let the shipping line know in real time. There are some cases where we might introduce a little bit of a five minute delay on purpose to give the person that created the movement some time to realize that they might have made an error and undo the message. But otherwise, we send all these messages in real time, which is an advantage over a lot of other software that batch them um, on a daily basis or wait until the end of an operation to send all the messages all at once. Now, if you have an operation that's lasting hours and hours, then you have a problem because you're gonna be um, sending all the messages at the end of the operation. Meanwhile, the, the, the shipping line wants to know, hey, this container um, arrived already, I wanna know. Now there's another type of messages um, that gets exchanged between shipping line and terminals, and that is vessel plans. So when a vessel is gonna arrive, there's a lot of planning around where we're gonna put the containers on the vessel. Um, and these are done via a file called a BAPLI file, which is an EDI fax standard. There is no equivalent to the BAPLI in the NCIX-12 standard. So even shipping lines that are using NCIX-12, they end up using the BAPLI file for vessel plans. Now, before the vessel arrives, the shipping line is going to send an arrival vessel plan to the terminal. That vessel plan is basically the state of the container vessel as it's arriving. It's gonna list all the containers that are on the vessel and their, their location, their weight, and extra additional information, if it's hazmat cargo or dangerous goods, etc. Now, this file is typically actually generated from the previous port of call because they basically are the one that loaded the vessel, so they know how they loaded it, and they, they produce that file and send it to the line. Then the line takes that file and sends it um, to the next terminal that will be receiving this vessel. In addition to that, that arrival vessel plan that tells you how the vessel is arriving at your port, then there's another BAPLI file or movings um, which represents the Presto vessel plan. So this is essentially a message saying, this is how I would like you to load this vessel. So this is how I would like this vessel to leave the port. Now, the, the, the more recommended way to do this would be to send a movings file because a movies file is the kind of equivalent to a BAPLI file with the difference that the movies files might have what we call projections. Projections are areas on the vessel where you don't know exactly which specific container you're gonna put but you know that you're gonna put a container that matches certain criteria. For example, I wanna put containers going to Port Everglades in this area, I want to put containers going to Port Miami in this area. So the movings file can, can do that. Now, even though there is normally the movings file should be used for that, I have seen a lot of times um, shipping lines or carriers using a BAPLI file to do that. And they're basically using a BAPLI file just like you would use a movings file, which is very common as well. Um, but essentially it's letting the terminal know, this is how I want you to load my vessels, this is where I want you to put the containers going to Jamaica. This is where I want you to put the containers going to Barbados. Okay. Now, the terminal is going to take that presto plan and they are going to complete it. Or if you want to think about this, like fill in the blank. All these projections 
Um, that said, I have a slot for 40 foot containers going to Jamaica here without the container numbers. The terminal is going to put in the container numbers in there and fill in the blank because the terminal planner is the one that knows how his containers are stacked at the terminal and therefore is the best person to organize these containers on the vessel in a way that maximizes um, the, the operations efficiency. So once the terminal goes ahead and prepare what we call the sequence of containers in the order in which they're going to load them, they send that pre-store vessel plan back to the shipping line, which is going to review it. Typically, there's a planner at the shipping line, a vessel planner that's going to review it and give some feedback back to the terminal. And there's kind of this feedback loop that goes on until both the terminal planner and the, the shipping line planner agree that, okay, we're, we're in agreement on how we're going to um, store these vessels. Um, you can go ahead and, and, and follow that plan. So then the vessel arrives and the stevedoring team at the terminal is going to start loading that vessel according to the pre store vessel plan. And if everything goes according to plan, they would have loaded the vessel exactly like it was suggested by the pre store plan. And that they take a final plan of how the vessel left the port, which is the final departure vessel plan. They give that to the captain on the vessel, um, but they also send that to the shipping line. Now, if everything goes according to plan, then the final departure vessel plan and the pre-store plan look exactly the same. But there's a Mike Tyson quote that I love where he says, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And if you've ever been around a terminal operation, you know, often time you get punched in the face during a vessel um, stevedoring operation. So there's a chance that during the operation, you were not able to follow the plan exactly and maybe there's two or three containers that are in different positions as they were on the pre store plan. That's why that final departure vessel plan is important because it's, while it should look exactly like the pre store plan, oftentimes it can look a bit differently because it is the actual record of what happened after the vessel operation. Again, I want to reiterate the fact that there's no equivalent EDI message for BAPLIS in the NCIX 12 format. Um, or standard, so everybody uses BAPLIs in the industry or move-ins. Now, there are other EDI messages that, um, as a cargo terminal, you might receive from, from some shipping line, or we've seen different things throughout um, the many implementations that we've done with Octopi. Um, so I'm going to mention them very quickly, but because they're not as commonly used, I'm not going to spend too much time on them. The first one is a ver mass message, which is a verified gross mass message. Which, which is essentially letting you know about um, the verified gross mass of a container arriving at your terminal. The next one is a corporal message, which is actually a discharge and loading order message for um, your vessel operation. The destin message is an equipment damage and repair estimate. So if you are a terminal that's actually repairing containers, you can pre prepare an estimate of what the damage and the repairs are going to be and send that to the, to the line using a destin media message. Finally, another message we've seen is an IFTMIN, which is an instruction message. Now, all the messages on the left here um, are EDI FAC messages. Now, on the right side, we have the 309 customs manifest, uh, which um, sometimes we've seen some lines send that to the terminals. There's a 315 message, which by the standard is supposed to be a status details message. So people use it for all types of different stuff. Um, but I've seen it used, for example, for shipping lines to let the terminal know when they've added new containers to their fleet of containers um, or to send information about bill of lading updates to the terminal. So it's used in a lot of different ways. It's actually one of the tough messages to deal with because people interpret and use it for so many different things. And then finally, if your terminal is a real terminal, um, you might be getting the 418 message, which is, the, which is a real advanced interchange consist which tells you the configuration, the rail cars, the platforms um, of, of the train that's coming to your terminal, what containers is on the platform, etc. And usually that comes along with a 419 message, which is actually the adds additional information um, such as the carrier way bill for the containers that are on the train coming your way. So again, the 418 and the 419 or all these messages on the right um, these are NCIX 12 messages. A lot more often you'll see these in the United States and typically outside of the United States, you do not see these messages. And, and especially around rail, you see different standards in Europe or even in Asia. 
Now in Octopi, we've already done EDI integration with all the lines that you've seen here and more. Um, so our team is ready um, to incorporate, if you're a terminal and you buy Octopi, um, we have experience with all these shipping lines and we can turn on an EDI integration with these lines very quickly. Um, and we've done more um, I, um, that, that, than, than this, but this is just a sample of some of the shipping lines that we have integrated our software with. Um, so we um, at Octopi have the philosophy that when it comes down to EDI, as you saw, these are very complex messages um, that, that it's a lot of gibberish if you're not a tech person. Um, and we believe that at a cargo terminal, you shouldn't have to, to spend time understanding EDI messages. Um, this should happen behind the scene. For example, if you're using Uber to order food, um, Uber is just an app um, that you can download to order food um, delivery in the US, so it's similar to Grubhub or, or Postman. When you place that food order, you know, you don't care how Uber um, send a message to the actual restaurant to let them know about your food order. You don't. You just use the app. It's very user friendly. You say, I want um, spaghetti and meatballs and that's it. And, 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 and you don't need to see what's happening down the wire. The philosophy that we have at Octopi is the same. When you use Octopi, you just get out full, get in full, discharge, and then Octopi takes care of the EDI message to the shipping line so that you don't have to worry about it. Anyways, um, hopefully this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to go to octopi.co to learn more about our product and how we handle EDI and to see how you can contact us to request or book a demo with us. Or if you have any questions about EDI, we're always happy to help and answer. Feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.